So, happy Friday. Today is Friday, May 27th, but we're taking a look back at a hive that I was visiting this past week, specifically May 24th. Listen carefully to this hive. You will hear a queen piping. In fact, more than one. But it's subtle. They're kind of quiet. But I'm going to explain what kind of a problem that presents, and I'm going to walk you through the entire event from swarming to swarm capture to hiving. I'm Frederick Dunn. This is the way to be. Listen to this hive and tell me if and when you can hear queens piping. So I hope you heard that. There was a primary queen piping and another queen responding, which means they're about to emerge from their queen cells, and that's a problem because that means a swarm is imminent. Wouldn't you know it. Here they go. They're headed out. This is two hours later. Hive number six. Now this is a question I get all the time. Why did they swarm? What's going on? What could you have done to prevent this swarm? This is a single deep Langstroth 10 frame hive that went through winter as a late season swarm. So the first question you might have is were they congested in there? Were there too many bees? Only six out of 10 frames were drawn in full. The rest are still available, so they had plenty of room. Was the entrance reducer too small? No, it was pretty much just right. So what on earth did you do wrong to cause these bees to decide to reproduce as a superorganism? Nothing. It's just what they do and what they're going to do. And it was by pure happenstance that I was out here drinking coffee and listening and knew that we had new queens about to emerge because before new queens emerge from their queen cells, the old queen has to depart. She has to get out of there to avoid conflict between queens. So our fertile laying queen that made it through winter is about to make her exit. It's nothing personal. They just have to go. It's that time of year. Now remember, we're looking back on May 24th, but stay with me in this video because I'm gonna show you a lot of different things here today. And what is gonna be the fact that these bees are gonna land in an area that's not very accessible to me on the very top of a tree more than 14 feet up how on earth would you even get those out of that tree but notice what's going on on the landing board here everyone's exiting a common question i get is how many bees would leave that colony well if it's a prime swarm up to 70 percent what kind of bees compose those that are leaving the hive well those that can fly for sure foragers workers that have been outside the hive very few nurse bees because nurse bees are not tough enough to make the trip generally. Look at those with the large eyes right there, center screen, drones. So drones even join swarms. They just go along for the ride because they need bees to feed them. And they're gonna scoot on out of here and we're gonna follow them and see where they went. So if you hear queens quacking, queens piping, queens communicating from inside their cells, you better get ready because something's about to happen. The other thing is, what time of day do they like to swarm? Well, in time from noon to three, prime. That doesn't mean that they can't do it at other times. It just means that statistically, that's when they do it most often. Also, you notice some of the bees are just arriving with their pollen on their hind legs. And they don't even know what's going on. They just go ahead and bring their resources in. But they also get caught up in the frenzy. And they will also depart with the swarm, which is why we see foragers collected in the bivouac location later that have pollen on their hind legs. What else is going on? Look at their abdomens. 
Some of them are parked and raising their abdomens in the air and fanning their wings as much as they can. And that's because what binds these bees together is the queen's pheromone. And they're spreading that in the air because what you don't see in this frame is the fact that there are hundreds if not thousands of bees hovering in front of this hive facing the landing board waiting for the queen to make her appearance and take to the air and wherever she lands that's where the rest of them will cluster so they've got their abdomens they're spreading her pheromone others are scooting in and out you'll see some go out and hover in front of the hive only to land and go back in. It's like they're anxious. They're wondering when the queen's going to come out. And I was really hoping that I could see the queen come out and make her appearance on the landing board because I'm standing by with a queen clip. If I could catch her, it would avoid all the effort of having to go and collect them from wherever they decide to bivouac. Usually, though, that bivouac location, and it's intermediate, that's not their final resting place, is pretty close to the apiary. So I have a couple of uh, things I'm trying out there to see if I can create a spot that's appealing to the bees to keep them lower, but that's another story altogether. Usually, when beekeepers get a call for a swarm or you see one of your own hives, your own colonies swarming out, landing in a tree, when it gets too high, they just write them off. Look what's going on here. Blue spruce tree, I think this blue spruce is about 20 feet total in height. Here's part of my experiment that I'm diddling around with. These are the better B. QMP is a synthetic queen mandibular pheromone. I'm gonna zip tie these to a couple lower branches and this is for future reference. This isn't gonna do diddly for the ones that are already following the primary queen that has left that hive. So, there they are. And you notice they're collecting in two, two clusters. One very small cluster to the right and one larger cluster to the left. And that kind of tells me that the cluster to the right also has some kind of pheromone that's attracting these bees and it might be a virgin queen. Virgin queens are not mated, just as the name suggests. And they are less appealing to the swarming bees than those that are mated and in lay. So look at the height. Like I said, most people would write them off. But I have an idea because I have a vacuum and I think I can get all the way up there. So I'm just zoomed in, but I want you to see the distinction here. When the bees cluster separately like this, nice heavy cluster to the left, tiny cluster to the right, 99.9% .9 of the time, if you collected that cluster to the right all by itself and sorted through it, you'd see a tiny queen with a small abdomen, unmated, brand new. And uh, you could hive her, but that's the other question. If I have 300, 400 bees, can I raise the queen? Will they take care of her? Generally, no, that's just far too few bees to manage it. This is my 10 foot step ladder. I've used it before. I guess I actually need a taller one. But before I go to committing my equipment, I need to climb up here, get a closer look, make sure the ladder is stable. See how close I can get to those bees and if it's even feasible for me to reach them. You know, we've seen the swarm collection tools with a water jug on the end of it. I've got a butterfly net that I could reach up and try to shake them into it, but I can't safely get high enough to grab the branch to clip it off I can't really shake them into anything, but I'm going to jump on this a little bit, get that settled. The ground is somewhat moist here because we've had a lot of rain. And the cluster is still, if I reach up with my arm there, they're a good four feet beyond my reach. So, would you just let them go? Also notice the long Langstroth hive behind me there, the green one, it's occupied, doing well. And to the right of the ladder, you see the Lands Hive also occupied. And here's what I have, the Colorado Bee Vac. I reviewed it before. I also went the extra yard and bought a 30 foot intake hose. And I stiffened it here with these little battens and I zip tied them to it because that's gonna make the hose rigid and give me an extended reach. I also put the vacuum inside this gorilla cart and set it in the shade because bees are gonna go to it. The other thing is this valve 
is adjusted for just the right amount of suction so that we don't damage the bees on the way through. And you want the valve directed at wherever your bees are and the exhaust, of course, away. Having a 30 foot hose is going to be quite an advantage. I paid, I think, over $80 for that hose by itself. But this is going to give me the reach I need, I think. Later, I'm going to put on a bee suit to do this, but for now, I've decided to stay comfortable because it is about 79 degrees on the day that I collected these. So I just want to get up here and see if it's going to reach. It sure is. And if I can rest it on that branch there, get it up in there. And you want the hose to be straight as much as possible because we don't want the bees to be tumbling through it and taking tight curves. It's not a amusement park ride. We're trying to disturb the bees as little as possible. So I'm just going to hang this here. Go off, get my bee suit on, come back, collect the bees. I think we're good. There they are nice and quiet. And notice they're still in two clusters. So I've reduced the sound. The bee vac is pretty noisy. But if you had to do a removal from a structure or something, you could run that hose in there. 30 feet is quite a distance. So you could leave the vacuum outside. Vibration, air movement, all that stuff. We don't want that bothering the bees. And I believe it comes with a 10 or 12 foot hose when you buy it. But I went, of course, the extra yard. I also bought extra collection boxes. So that's the cluster that I think has the Mated Queen just because of the number of bees that have accumulated around her. And I also think that to the right there's the non-Mated Queen and that's just because she has almost no following. And now when you start to use your vacuum, if you feel the bees in your hand really bumping and clanking against the interior surfaces of it, Stop vacuuming them up and go down and open the intake valve, that white valve, just a little more so that there's less suction because the goal is not to agitate or damage the bees. And of course, we've got the queen in here somewhere. If she takes a heavy tumble, you damage your queen, you've basically defeated the future of this colony. So we're going to get these all into the box and I'm also going to show you how I'm going to install them. And this tool is very handy. So without the bee vac extension like this, I would have just had to let them go, which is not great. We have a really great uh, time of year here. We're still in May, so it's a good time to collect swarms. They have plenty of time to build up. And I'll go over some of the purposes of resource hives, nucleus hives, and things like that as this video continues. But for now, we're just going to walk you through this. You'll also notice that the bees are flying around and still showing up. And if you hold the hose intake out, they'll even fly up to the end of it after you've had a lot of bees pass through it. And they'll get sucked right in, right out of the air. The other thing is, if you look at your bee vac while it's running and while you're collecting a swarm, you'll realize quickly that you've got the queen when you see bees flying around in the exhaust of that vacuum cleaner because uh, they're smelling the pheromone from that queen. Now I did suck up both of those collected, uh, those clusters of bees. So I might have an unmated queen as well as the mated queen together. That's not the end of the earth. The mated queen is going to take priority. There is a chance, of course, that the workers in that colony that are faithful to the mated queen that's in lay, they may kill the other queen. Uh, but the deal is, if you left her by herself out there, those that clustered around her would expire with her. She really doesn't have a big enough following to do anything. So I sped this up, of course. This is five times normal speed. Reduce the audio so you wouldn't be annoyed. And we just keep getting the bees off of these branches as they cluster. But there's another thing that I want you to observe. Once your vacuuming has stopped and sometimes you go away, we see bees still clustering on the branch and that's because there's a residual pheromone there. So you need to notice, are they searching or do they cluster quietly and focus the cluster? If they loosely cluster and you see constant movement, then they're actually searching for the queen, which means you probably were successful and you've got her. 
So they're clustering just because residual pheromones are on the branch. And that's what I'm doing with the QMP that I showed earlier is I'm trying to create an artificial pheromone on a lower branch that later will attract future swarms. So they're clustered there, but when you really look at them, they're not settled. They're walking all over each other. They're searching for the physical queen, even though the pheromone has attracted them there. Uh, she's gone. So we already got her. I can tell you in advance, we got the queen and she's in the vacuum. Now what happens if you don't collect these bees that are still coming and collecting on the branch? They give up and they return to their parent colony. So here's how we close off the vac. We want to make sure and turn it off at the same time that we close up the suction. We don't want the bees going back into the hose. And now you pull off the lid and it's nothing but screen. So they're nicely ventilated. You definitely don't want to turn off the vacuum cleaner until you have uh, been prepared to open up that cover because they'll heat up very fast. You can also use this box to transport the bees. Very easy to do. On the same day, I went and got another swarm in another town and used another box to go and collect them. So now I'm going to show you what I do to install them because it's different than what most people do. Here are the bees. It's not a huge cluster. See, they're small. So I'm not going to put them in a full-size hive. I'm going to put them in a nucleus. Question is, how am I going to install them? Now the practice would be to pull off that migratory cover. This is a fine frame deep nuke. And that you would shake them in from the top. Or if you've got time, and I've got the time, I'm going to put the Colorado Bee Vac intake box on a Bee Smart stand with my homemade bottom board there that I just used for utility in the bee yard. I'm going to set the box right on it. And I'm going to put that black intake fitting right up against the nucleus hive. Physical contact is pretty important. I angled it so that we could, of course, make a video. And then I'm going to slide open the control gate here. The goal is for the bees to voluntarily walk into this five frame deep nucleus box. Because they're less agitated. They get to work right away. When you do a lot of shaking, banging, dumping, agitating, I understand. Your commercial beekeeper, something like that, you have to move fast. You have a lot of work to do. If you're a backyard beekeeper, as I am, I've got time on my hands. So what I like to do is put this entrance right up to the entrance of the box I want them to go in. And then I hope that those that make decisions for this colony, because at this point, it's the workers that make the decision whether to stay or go, not the queen. And... Uh, I want them to go in, explore the box, decide that it's worth staying, and then they'll start fanning their pheromone, as the one top center is doing. And they'll try to attract other bees from their own colony, and they will go into that box on their own. Now there's one reaching out with her tongue, getting some resources from the bee that's inside the box, facing out. The one that extends the tongue is always receiving, not giving. And what's in the box? Okay, so it's a five frame deep box. I put three deep frames that are heavy wax coated. I have two medium frames in the center that are capped honey. We have rain ahead and cooler weather ahead. So I wanted them to have resources that they need so that they can stay warm and they can start doing their work. Now what happens? Will they draw out the rest of those medium frames? I'm gonna forecast that and say that they will. But the comb that they generally build in the bottom of medium frames in a deep box like this would be drone comb, but we'll see. So we've documented this. This is nucleus number 10. It has an identifying tag on the front of it, and we're going to visit it later. I'm going to explain some other things to think about as we go forward for now. We're just sitting around with coffee and enjoying watching them going in. Now, could they leave? Could they reject the box and just fly out and bivouac again at another location? They sure could. But guess what? I think in all the time I've been keeping bees, which goes back to oh, 2007, I've only had one swarm reject the box that I was putting them in. So I've stopped dumping them in. Just let them walk in. It's more fun anyway. Plus, if you're sitting here and you see the queen, 
cross deck into her new hive, then that's exciting too. We're also looking at the physical condition of the bees that are going in. Did they get damaged by the vacuum cleaner? Uh, most of them look okay. Are they agitated or are they pretty calm? Their conduct is pretty normal. Not only that, I'm right here. I'm within inches of the hive and they're non-defensive. Most swarms are non-defensive anyway, but you can be stung. So these are not paying any attention to me and I'm very uh, happy to see them fanning their pheromones to keep everyone together. And look at the one right on top of the intake fitting there. You can see light passing through her abdomen, very close to her thorax. That's because she's full of honey and resources that they took from the other hive before they left. So they are ready to build comb. They're ready to produce wax. They're ready to feed baby bees. And the foragers are ready to go out and get all the pollen that they need. Look at this one, just fanning the pheromones around, doing her part. But look how full and extended her abdomen is. These are healthy bees. So in other words, they didn't leave because they were distressed, because there was some disease, or they're not healthy, or they're greasy looking. These are healthy bees that did a normal reproduction of a superorganism, and uh, just so happened that they decided to do it. Again, nothing to do with management, because they had the space. All the things that you would do to keep your bees from swarming were done in the parent colony. So it was a great opportunity to share you know these different levels and stages and activities and behaviors with you and you can see it they're all going in it looks good to me we're also going to follow up keep uh, in mind that this all happened on may 24th and i'm going to give you the update tell you in advance that they stayed by the way these uh, wooden nucleus hives. Somebody's probably going to ask where I got them. I did buy them at Better Bee. I checked in and looked at their online catalog and they're sold out, but they're very easy to make. Other ones sell them. So here's the update. Here we are today, May 27th. So remember they were hived on the 24th. So we're three days later. We have bad weather. It's in the sixties. It's raining. It's miserable but they're settled. Listen to them. Listen to how quiet they are. And there is a smattering of uh, pollen coming in. Not today while it's all wet, but they have definitely settled and decided that this is their home and the space is manageable for the bees. Five frames, small box, easy going. And we're looking for pollen coming in, but that's not critical. What we're looking for is that they're settled. And here's today, just to give you a shot, rain forecast for the next 12, 24 hours, 63 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 17 degrees Celsius. Not a great day. So the entire apiary is basically quiet. These are other resource hives, nucleus hives, double deckers, five over five, deep frames over deep frames. And uh, they went through winter on their own. So what's the purpose of a resource hive? Well, we can use them to draw out comb, store honey, create eggs, and provide resources for other colonies that what might be starting out. So for example, if the colony that we collected today uh, is not able to accelerate their numbers as quickly as we'd like them to, we need to keep hive number 22, for example, from swarming. So we could pull one deep frame of fully capped brood and put it in there and boost their workforce by more than 5,000 bees. Single frame. And then we just take one of the frames from hive 10 here, one of the outboard frames, and we put it in the other hive in order for them to finish drawing that out. So resource hives, just let us balance things out. If you're inspecting one of your main colonies and you find that uh, they're without a queen, for example, you don't have to buy in a queen anymore. You walk over to one of your nucleus colonies, you look to see which one is the most populated, and you pull a deep frame of eggs and open larvae, and you put those in the queenless colony, and they can select one of the eggs on their own and make a emergency queen cell, create a queen, and take care of things. The other thing is here, this is a small colony. I like to cut that hole in half there. Now these big plastic wheels, for entrance control are my favorite now. 
They have a setting here, wide open, of course, on the right, which it says free. On the left, it says ventilation, but also says SHB. And that could be small hive beetle protection. I don't know. But on the upper right, it's for bumblebees. And of course, top left is a queen excluder. So another question that I often get is, would you put the queen excluder down to keep the queen from getting away? No, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't like to put any restriction on them. If they want to go, they can go. However, as I said earlier on, they don't leave. They stay. So there again, we didn't stress them. How soon should you be looking in on them? No sooner than nine days, by the way. And what would you do at nine days? Oxalic acid vaporization, if you suspect that they have a striker mites, it's your window of opportunity. On the ninth day, treat with OAV. You get more than 90% efficacy on Varroa destructor mites. Very easy to do. One treatment and you're done. And that's true of hiving any swarm. You do a split, the split that does not have the queen that ends up broodless for a period, an opportunity again to treat for Varroa destructor mites if that's what you want to do. Hope you enjoyed today's capture of a swarm. Too high normally, but with an extension of the Colorado BVAC, it worked. Thanks for watching. Have a fantastic weekend. Keep up with those swarms. Get yourself some Nucleus Resource Hives.